Okay, the book of James, Practical Christianity, name of the series, lesson number four in the series and the title of this lesson tonight, The Bottom Line, The Bottom Line. If you're following along in your Bibles, uh, James chapter one, and hopefully we will cover verses 16 to 27. You know, there's always been a great debate, uh, not just a great debate, but a lot of debate in the religious world. And our brotherhood is no different. If you read uh, journals and magazines published by different individuals, books filled with passionate arguments over issues such as you know, the elements of worship or uh, uh, the use of instruments in worship or the methods that, we, uh, that are uh, you know, most effective in evangelism, approaches to interpretation. You know, there's always debate going on, nothing new. Nothing new, the early church was not free from this type of problem. Some people think, you know, oh, the restoration movement, we're going back to you know, primitive Christianity, biblical Christianity means uh, no debates. That, won't that be wonderful? Everything, everyone will agree. Well, you know, that's not true. We know that's not true. In the early church, uh, they were not free from debates. I mean, in Acts chapter six, right? The feeding of the widows the Grecian widows, and there was a dispute. How do we distribute the food? Imagine that. I don't think we've ever had a dispute in this congregation about the distribution of food to people who, who come. You know, they, they call uh, Brian Capps up and he, you know, he gets their information, people get their food. Uh, but here they were disputing about how the food was going to be distributed. And the, the Bible, uh, you know, in the New Testament, uh, almost half a chapter devoted just to how they resolve this, this issue. You know? Methodology versus responsibility. Which way we're going to do it and who's going to be responsible? And finally, you know, they picked some men, they became deacons, um, and they distributed the food. In Acts 15, should non-Jews be accepted into the church? There was a dispute, nearly ruined everything at the very beginning. Well, what are we going to have, the gospel of grace, or are we going to go by the law? Which way, which way is it going to be? That was a big dispute. Big argument. And then in 1 Corinthians, you know, question of procedure in worship. Paul spends a lot of time talking about the order of worship and who prays and the role of men and the role of women in public worship. And so I'm saying this to say there's always been debate, always been discussion about different things uh, taking, uh, taking place in the, in the church. So we should neither be surprised nor discouraged with this element of church life. It's always been, will always be, until, and it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, I just want to quote this one here, Paul says, when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. I believe that Paul not only refers to the full revelation of the word of God in this passage here, but also what is implied is the full accomplishment of everything that is in the word. See, the time that he was writing this, not all of God's word had been given. There were still epistles to write and you know. And Paul is saying, when the perfect comes, and we've interpreted that to mean, well, when, the, when all of the word is finally given, compiled, preserved, when the perfect come, he says, uh, the imperfect will pass away. So we're saying that when the perfect come is not only when the complete word is given, but the full accomplishment of everything that's in the word is accomplished as well. In other words, when all that the word reveals fully matures, such as the coming of Christ. That hasn't matured yet. He hasn't come yet. So when all this happens, we will all finally have the knowledge and the insight that will bring us into perfect unity and harmony with one another. This is what he is talking about here. In the meantime, there still is a struggle in the kingdom, in the church, there still exists a multiplicity of opinions on a variety of issues that require patience and love and continued prayer and study in order to maintain unity. You know, it's easy to maintain unity when everybody agrees on everything. It's when you have disagreements, it's when you have a different point of view, a different understanding of what the word says, of how to do something, what it actually means, 
boy, when you don't agree then, then it's a little more difficult to have that unity that uh, they talk about uh, in the Bible. Now, having said this much, this doesn't mean that we cannot come to concrete conclusions about significant important points that the Bible teaches. I mean, we're not agnostics, right? We're not agnostics who, you know, they kind of throw up their hands, you know, doubters, and they say, well, if we can't have uniform opinion on one point, there's no use in trying on anything else. You know, they just, they quit and eventually fall into disbelief. You know, that's a cop out. We, you know, just because we can't agree or don't understand everything exactly the same way doesn't mean we have to quit on everything, right? So I say all of this to say the following. The entire book of James is a testimony to the idea that despite the disputes, we can still get to the bottom line about different aspects of the Christian religion. So this next section here that we're going to study um, actually sets the tone for the rest of his epistle by clearly defining what type of thinking and what type of behavior constitutes the bottom line in what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. In other words, James sets forth things that are indisputable, things that are easy to understand, things that we can all easily understand and agree upon. So we're going to go to a verse 16. Verse 16 to 18 in chapter one uh, will form a bridge, if you wish, between the discussion about the mechanics of temptation and sin. You know, that's what we talked about last time. He was explaining how sin happens in our life. right? It's going to create a bridge between the discussion about the mechanics of temptation and sin in general, and then talk about behavior indicative of the Christian way of life. Now remember, our general theme is that Christianity is a way of life, not just religious observances. And James articulates this way of life in clear and unmistakable terms. OK, so let's go to verse 16, short one. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. A simple imperative statement, if you remember your grammar in school, an imperative statement, not declarative, imperative, command. He says, don't be fooled. Don't kid yourself. Don't let others lie to you. We ought to be on guard not to be victims of delusion. Do not be deceived, he says, my beloved brethren. Goes on in verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So don't be fooled, he says. Don't be deceived. God sends good things. Don't be fooled about that. Know for sure, he says, God sends good things. A reference to the previous passage where James teaches that God does not seduce anyone to do evil by enticing him with evil. Remember we were talking about that last time? So he's saying here, look, some things are not debatable, such as God is good and pure and delights in righteousness this is a sure and eternal principle. You can take that to the bank. You can be positive of that. You can stake your life on that. Secondly, you can be sure there is never a compromise in God's promises due to weakness or change of character. And he talks about unlike the stars that change brightness. Interesting that a man living in the first century <laughs> would use as a comparison for God's sureness the fading of stars. How could he know that in the first century? We, we've, only we've only understood that scientifically for what, about a century? They didn't know that in the first century, that stars burn out. They didn't know that. How could he know this? Great argument for the inspiration of scripture. But let's not lose the point, right? The point is, 
no compromises in God's promises, hey, for good or for evil. If He promised He's going to reward you, you can be sure you'll be rewarded. But if He promised He's going to punish you, you can be absolutely sure that's going to happen too. So you can take that to the bank. And then the third thing He says, blaming God for the evil and sin in life is a sign that one has believed a lie. You've been duped. You've, you've believed the wrong thing if you think God is the one responsible and I, and I hear people do that all the time, especially, especially if they're in pain. You know, if they've had a tragedy or something, they're mad at God, why did He do this? You know, why did He take my child? Or why did this happen? Why did I lose my job? Accusing God of doing evil. You know, no, God doesn't do that. James says you can be absolutely sure God's not the one that sends the evil. On the contrary, verse 18 he says, in the exercise of His will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. He says, on the contrary, God's will is not for evil or for destruction, but rather for good and life eternal. So he says, through the word, word of God, we are born again. This is God's will, he says. How are we born through the word? Well, through the preaching of the gospel. We preach the gospel. People hear the gospel. They respond to it. They repent. They're baptized. They, you know, they, they have a new life, new creatures in Christ. Now, we have to realize that the Jews that James is talking to in this letter were among the first Christians. So James refers to them as the first fruit, the beginning of the harvest of this new creation. Those who are born again through faith in Christ, these are the new creation he's talking about. So that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. He's not talking about animals here. He's not talking about the creation back in Genesis. He's talking about the new creation. Who are the first fruits? Well, those Jews that believed and became Christians starting at Pentecost. But we know that for many, many years, uh, the apostles only preached to Jews. <laughs> when they heard Jesus say to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, you know, they thought, oh, you want us to go all over the world and preach to Jews? <laughs> it took them a decade to figure out, oh, oh you, mean, you mean everybody, not just the Jews. That was, that was the problem that was happening in the early, in the early church. So, don't be fooled, he said, by the notion that evil desire and conduct comes from or is tolerated by God. God is good and He has saved you so that you can live a good and pure life. So that's the bridge idea that takes him from when he was talking about how does temptation work you know, to his next discussion. And the next discussion will be the bottom line of Christian conduct. So the balance of the entire epistle is a series of exhortations clearly defining the bottom line insofar as Christian conduct is concerned. So in our lesson tonight, we're going to look at the primary trademark of the Christian life. And the primary trademark of the Christian life is a person's attitude towards God's word. You know, we like to jump ahead right away. Well, the trademark of a Christian, well, you know, he, uh, he goes to church all the time or she does this or, you know, they, uh, they try to be pure sexually, you know, we, and those things are true. But the very first thing before all of those other things come into play, the first trademark, how does this person respond to God's word? You know the parable of the seed, the sower? What's that all about? Well, it's how do different people respond to God's word? So James you know, doesn't even make a reference to this, but he picks up that idea and he said, look, the very first thing that you're going to find out about a Christian in determining that person's legitimacy, that person's sincerity is watch how they respond to the word of God. So he mentioned that our initial birth as new creatures was conceived by the word of God, which is the seed 
that produces the kingdom inside of us. Now he's going to explain that it is the way we continue to respond to the word that determines our growth as Christians. So let, let me just summarize what I've said so far. God is good. God sends good. God wants us to be good. All right, now, being good, therefore, is seen in your attitude, the way you live your life, and a good attitude is seen is in how you respond to God's work. All right, there's the setup. The way that you respond has two major elements. And here he gets to the meat of the matter. Everything else was to set up what he's going to say now. So the way you respond has two major elements. Number one, the way you listen. James 1.19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So in verse 19, in view of God's power, we ought to be eager to hear what He has to say to us. You know, whether, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or you're for the, I don't know, whatever, you know, the Goose Party, whoever you're for, right, left, if tonight we said, by some strange circumstances, her plane you know, got diverted to Will Rogers and Hillary Clinton will be here tonight. Whether you like her or not, you'd want to, she's going to be here? Well, Mike's class, Hillary Clinton. You know, you'd just be curious, you'd want to, you want, what, do, what does she have to say? I mean, I have some questions, for, I'd like to ask her some questions. Or if it was Trump, or if it was, you know, so James is saying, if you're anxious to hear like just a human being, how anxious should you be to hear what God has to say to you, to me? So some are eager to be baptized for forgiveness, but they're not eager to hear about self-control or obedience or good deeds or giving or fidelity or worship or sacrifice or study or perseverance, so on and so forth. We love the part about repent and be baptized, all your sins are forgiven, you're going to heaven. Oh, I like that part. It's the other stuff I, I'm not so crazy about. So slow to speak in the sense of talking back or rebelling against what God says. This isn't about, <laughs> I know a lot of times we take this passage and we use it to determine human relationships between one another, and I guess this would work, but James is not talking about how we should be relating to each other, you know, slow to, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He's talking about how we relate to God. So slow to speak in the sense of talking back or rebelling against what God says, grumbling, complaining slow to anger at what the word of God tells us. Many times we get mad at the teacher or the preacher because he reveals our sins and calls us to change. In reality, we're just mad at God's word. And I'll give you a little you know, inside baseball here. Uh, 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 you ask somebody who's been preaching for a time and he'll tell you that you can actually feel the resistance you can feel the resistance of the audience if you're saying things that, are not, <laughs> that they're not wanting to hear. You can actually feel it. You, it's, it's like pushing an invisible thing. You know? it, there's, there's like emotional and spiritual slapback, like an echo coming back at you. Just like you, you can tell if you're a speaker, if that's what you do, you can tell when what you're saying is also being absorbed. And so James is talking about this type of thing. How do we listen to God's, to God's word? Do we talk back? Do we get angry and frustrated? Sometimes, you know when he said slow to speak, sometimes we jump ahead of God. We don't wait for Him. You know, we make a prayer and we say, please help me, let me know what to do. And two seconds later, we're off with our own plan. <laughs> Instead of saying, Lord, I'm not sure what to do here, and then wait. 
just wait? We have to be able to say, God, you know what? I have confidence in you that you know how to let me know what I need to do. I have faith that you have the ability to let me know, you know when you're talking to me, when you want me to do something. All right, verse 20. He says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Responding to God in anger, doing His will with grumbling and complaining does not produce the right kind of works in God's eyes. That's his point. He wants us to do good and to do good with a willing and humble heart. Not the, you know, the older brother syndrome, you know, the prodigal son, the older brother. Yeah, he had stayed with his dad and he had done everything the dad wanted, but he wasn't happy about it. You never gave me a goat, <laughs> never gave me a sheep, never threw a party for me. You know. Or the first son syndrome, you know, Matthew 21. You know, the father tells him, you do something, he says, no, I won't. Uh, he said, yes, I will. The first, yes, I will, but then doesn't do it. And then the second son says, no, I don't. But then he thinks about it and goes back and do it. Neither response is acceptable, by the way. We always say, oh, oh the one who, who said no, but then did it, well, it's okay. Well, what's the right response? Yes, I'll do it. And then I, I do it. That's the, that's the right response. Verse 21, he says, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Remember what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about how people you know, react to God's word. That's the bottom line. So here James suggests in verse 21 that the reason for backtalk and anger at God's word is the presence of sin in a person's life. He tells his readers that they must first remove the sin in their lives in order to receive the word in their hearts. The more sin you get out of your heart, the more of God's word finds room in your heart. Receiving with meekness the word is removing sin and receiving the word. That's what that means. See, only when this is done can the word enter into um, the heart in order to save, in order to transform that person. You can't receive the word without removing the sin. And here's the catch. Only you can remove the sin. God can give you insight. He can give you understanding. But you're the one, we're the ones that remove the sin. He doesn't do that part. He offers forgiveness for the sin, you know, and, but we're the ones that do the repenting. We're the ones that say, this has got to go, this is not right in my life. I, I now begin on taking this out of my, we're the one that has to do that. He doesn't come along and rip it all out of our, our hearts. A lot of times the reason that our faith is flat and we have no taste for God, is because the sin in our lives will not allow the word to come in and revive us. I mean, that's just, that's the spiritual mechanics of how spiritual life works. You know, if your spiritual life is flat, don't blame God. If your spiritual life is flat, then examine your heart and see what's getting in the way. Now there's a prayer God will answer. In all my life, in all my prayer life, you know, some prayers were answered and some I didn't know if they were or not, some are pending, but one prayer that always gets answered. Dear God, show me my sins. <laughs> that prayer always gets answered. It will always show you what it is that we, we need to deal with. Because he loves us and he understands that if we remove these things, if we work on these things, there's more room for him, more room for the spirit. And obviously, you know, I'm talking in human terms here just to try to get our brains around these ideas. All right, the next thing. 
So remember I said responding has two elements. Elements, the way we listen, that's what I've been just discussing, the way we listen. Are we, are we you know, quick to listen, not talk back, get angry at God, all that business, that's one way. And then the second element as far as responding, the way we respond. He says, but prove yourselves doer of the, doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So the Christian life involves hearing God's word properly and responding to it effectively as well. Another warning was not to kid yourself into thinking that just understanding the word is enough to create the transformation from fleshly to spiritual. The only way that God's word has any impact for change and transformation is when we act on it. It's not enough to just understand it. Not enough. I mean, you know, <laughs> the beginning part is understanding it for sure. It's like baptism, right? There's no forgiveness without actually being back. You could understand that it's necessary to repent and then express your faith in the waters of baptism. That's great if you really understand it, but it isn't effective for you until you actually do it. You know, Lise is not here, uh, she's, she's in South Carolina, but if she were here, she'd tell you that was her experience. She would be telling other people, you know, I, I really think you need to be baptized. <laughs> and then she started to think, well, you know what? <laughs> I haven't done that. Like she knew that was the right thing to do. And in, in some discussions, you know, she, would, she would say, well, you know, the Bible says you, know, you ought to be baptized. She was quick to point it out. And then after a time, not a long time, but after a time realized, well, wait a minute, I'm telling other people to do this and I firmly believe that it's the right and biblical thing to do, but I have not yet myself done it. I think we do that a lot of times. Verse 23 to 25, he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. He uses the illustration of a mirror to make his point here about responding. A man who hears but doesn't do is like a person who looks into a mirror, he sees something is, you know, needs correction or change, but he doesn't do it and he walks away. Well, what's the point? Well, the mirror has not helped him to correct his problem. He remains unchanged. So James refers to the gospel. When he talks about the gospel, he, he, he uses the term the law of liberty. You know, I've told you in the Bible, the writers use sometimes ver various terms to always refer to the same thing. So the law of liberty is the gospel, a law that frees us from sin Right, the law of liberty, the gospel, is a law that frees us from sin, but not responsibility to do what is right and good. We have freedom, not license. There's a difference. There's a difference. So James refers to the gospel as the mirror in which a person can truly see himself for what he really is. And those who hear and don't do, he says, are like the people who see themselves in the mirror, but don't change anything about their appearance. And he says, or the, the conclusion is, the experience was for nothing. It was useless. It was fruitless. It's, I'll go back to baptism. Baptism is useless without repentance. You're just getting wet. Repentance is useless without baptism. You haven't obeyed. You know, it's the whole thing that works together. So the one who does act, however, on what he or she sees will be blessed in what he does. He has seen and changed and blessed because of it. You know, it's like uh, he's talking about repentance here, you know, changing our ways, adapting our ways according to God's word. Repentance like an alternator that keeps the battery of faith charged. Without the alternator, the battery will soon run out of juice. Without repentance, constant repentance, our faith runs out of juice eventually. Unfortunately, a lot of times we think, well, you know, I, I do that, you know, oh, I was baptized 42 years ago and I repented then. And <laughs> like that was the last time. 
No, no, repentance is an ongoing thing. Just like confessing Christ is an ongoing thing. Just like believing is an ongoing thing. The only one-time thing is the physical act of baptism. Why? Because it records a historical date. On that date, at that point in history and time, you went from being a non-Christian to a Christian, non-disciple to a disciple, unsafe to save. You know, it marks the time in history. Just like the cross of Jesus marks the time in history when our sins were paid for, our baptism marks our time in history when we've received uh, our salvation. Verse 26 and 7, he says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So in these final verses, James gives three examples of what the mirror can reveal and the proper response. First, the control of the tongue. You know, you're looking at yourself, you're examining yourself, maybe the tongue is the problem. And I mean the tongue, how many ways can we sin with our tongue? Oh boy, <laughs> so many ways, right? Lying, uh, abusive language, uh, cheating, uh, pride, uh, gossip, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. But he just kind of squeezes it all together and just says the tongue, okay? Something else you see in the mirror, uh, benevolence, not just you're doing the benevolence, but is there benevolence that needs being done by you that you're neglecting? Again, he, he, he compresses everything. Things as simple as you know, caring for a sick parent to uh, donating money for the home, you know. And purity of life, again, covers so many, you know, the way you conduct yourself, your thinking, your attitude towards people, not just, quote, sexual purity, which of course it, it includes that, but purity of your speech, purity of your relationships, the way you deal with people. If after hearing the word, one sees that gossip or coarse language or slander or lies or pride are part of your life, he's saying, then a change is necessary. If after hearing the word, one sees a need to improve or increase one's quantity or quality of good works, then a change needs to take place, he's saying. If after hearing the word, one recognizes that their lives are too full of worldliness and too little concern with the kingdom of God, then a change needs to take place. And I think many times that third thing, worldliness, that that is a much more you know, dangerous thing than, than the other two. You know, we have a problem with the other two, but that one. When we live in a very wealthy country, it's so easy to be completely consumed with worldliness, things. Things I do, things I want, things I want to go to, places, you know. Our life is filled with the desire and the management of things and too little time given over to prayer. Devotion. So the bottom line in uh, uh, Christianity, I think I have another thing, here we go. The bottom line in Christianity is that God's word has the power not only to bring us to salvation, but also to transform us. And this transformation can only take place if we eagerly do what God tells us to do and not just fool ourselves into thinking that sitting in the pew is enough. Church buildings are filled with people sitting in the pew. James is taught, remember, he's talking to Christians here. He's not, he's not lambasting some non-believer about the, their wicked ways. He's talking to Christians here. And he's saying to them, hey, you know, let the word be your mirror and don't just walk away without making a change. All right, like I said, James to the point, simple to understand, but now we're into the meat of the matter as we go through and finish up you know, in the weeks to come. He's just going to tackle different areas of life. Not always easy listening to James, it's like the Proverbs, you know, whenever I read the Proverbs and they talk about the fool, <laughs> 
His name is Mike. <laughs> All right, that's it. We'll see you next time. <laughs>